Welcome back. It's still Africa update here on Trust TV, and I'm your host, Chiamaka Mwafo. Now, the streets of Port-au-Prince were patrolled by Kenyan police officers on Wednesday, equipped with body armor and automatic weapons. This group, the initial UN-supported foreign police unit in Haiti, arrived in the country in June in response to a plea for assistance to combat escalating gang violence. African News tells us more. Kenyan police officers equipped with body armor and armed with automatic weapons were observed conducting patrols in the streets of the Haitian capital on Wednesday. Haiti's Prime Minister Gary Corneal told the Security Council on Wednesday that he welcomed the implementation of the multinational security support mission. Haiti is currently at a critical point with 12,000 armed individuals holding a population of 12 million hostages. At this decisive junction, no project, be it economic or political, can be tackled without addressing the security issue. For that reason, my government welcomed the implementation of the commitments made in Resolution 2699 regarding the multinational security support mission. The deployment of the first contingent of police officers alongside Haitian law enforcement agencies should help put a stop to the barbarity of criminal Groups. Hundreds of Kenyan police officers arrived in Haiti on June 25th as part of the multinational security support mission to help release the country from the tight hold of armed criminal guns. Now that was giving us an insight on what's happening in Haiti with the Kenyan police. Joining me in the studio to discuss this further is Ambassador Bulus. Lolo. And, you know, we've had him before on the program, and in case you don't know who he is, he is the um, a former permanent secretary of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Yes. Thank you, Ambassador, for joining us today. Thank you, Chair Maka. Always a pleasure to be with you. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now, um, um, Kenya has been experiencing protests. Right. Um, they have internal wranglings due mm -hmm. to economic crisis. Mm -hmm. And I know this Haiti situation has been there. They've been saying they're going to go there. Uh, though I think some members of the parliament or country opposition are not in support of it or opposed right. to it. Mm -hmm. Now, how does this, how is this a good time for Kenya to really go do this now in Haiti, considering the problems, internal problems, still protests still happening in, right. in the country? Well, um, it's a good question asking whether it is the right time for Kenya to reach out and support the measures in Haiti or not. For a start, if you look at the history of Haiti, it was a former French colony and um, led the way for protests and demonstration of willpower where people suffer oppression to a point that they can no longer endure. Haiti, successfully, as small as it is, a tiny country in the Western Hemisphere, rose against French rule and asserted its own independence more than 200 years ago. And since that time, it has been an independent country, but it also carries the toga of being the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. Largely and predominantly, it is um, of African descent. That was the last port, more or less, of uh, the slave port where, I mean, from where the slaves were taken across South America and North America. Being French in orientation and tradition, one will ask, what are the Kenyans doing? But African solidarity will come to play. But whether or not the timing is right for the government of Kenya to send out a contingent to Haiti is for another day and another discussion. All because the commitment to send came before the protests yes, in yes. Kenya. Mm. But at the same time, just like the saying, I think, in the Bible, physician, heal thyself. In other words, is Kenya in a position to lend a helping hand to Haiti? 
I would say there is no time that one cannot and should not lend a helping hand. 200, I think, is the size of the contingent, police personnel, fully armed. Whether or not they'll be able to carve the space to contain the, the, the gang violence in Kenya is yet another thing to talk about. But the protests in Kenya should not be taken for granted. And I know that's why the Kenyan president, William Ruto, had to address the nation. They've beaten back on the measures they wanted to take, largely the finance bill that the people rose against. And I think that government will not be in a hurry to represent the same bill or the direction that they wanted to go. So I'll leave it at this. If um, We'll continue with the conversation. Okay. Yeah. So now, um, the Haitian gangs apparently mm -hmm. um, control 80% of the capital. Right. Now, do you see the possibility of these gangs being defeated? You know, now maybe the Kenyan guys are there, maybe they have some advancement, you know, that the police in Haiti doesn't have. Um, where, and it's amazing to see the rise of the gangs in, in Haiti. They all started like a joke. But let's not forget that in 2010, Haiti was devastated by an earthquake. Mm -hmm. And from that time till now, the government has not fully recovered. And they've not had a very, very stable government that will lead and take the measures necessary. Equally to Haiti does not have the resources to address the ever-rising expectations of the people. Earlier on, I noted that Haiti is a desperately poor country. And because of that, demands are always higher than the capacity of the government to deliver. And this, in a way then, where the government is not stable, corruption is rife, and uh, services are lacking, that the man or woman who can take up arms will be able to carve a little territory and rule within that enclave. Now, to your question, if the presence of the Kenyan police will make a difference, it's too early to say. But I think it is part of an, an international force, stabilizing force, as it were, set up by the Security Council to contain the violence in Haiti. My fear generally is, unless the gangs themselves are worn out by violence, the sheer scale of violence, you know, and the gangs decimating one another, it will be extremely difficult for a foreign force without fighting a direct war to really stabilize things in Haiti. And, um, by the nature of the country, the capital virtually is the country itself because everything is concentrated in Port-au-Prince. Okay. I visited um, Haiti, and I know that settlements outside of the capital really aren't anything to, to write home. So if you contain the situation in the capital, yes, chances are you contain elsewhere as well. Okay. So we're going to move over to South Africa. Mm -hmm. And uh, South African President Cyril Ramaphosa has included sev seven different parties in his cabinet in an unprecedented power-sharing agreement in the continent's most industrialized country. Right. This came after the African National Congress lost its parliamentary majority in a milestone election result in late May. Let's take more from Africa News. South African President Cyril Maposa named a new cabinet after his African National Congress NC party. The main opposition in nine other parties agreed on the makeup of a coalition government following weeks of negotiations. Ramaphosa's party retained the largest share of ministerial positions as he appointed NC officials to 20 of the 32 cabinet minister roles. There were also six ministers from the main opposition Democratic Alliance and Ramaphosa shared out the remaining ministerial posts among some of the smaller parties. Ramaphosa's announcement of his multi-party cabinet came a month after the ANC lost its 30-year political dominance in a national election, forcing it into an unprecedented power-sharing agreement. 
ANC nominated Paul Mashatile, who was reappointed as deputy president. It also kept key ministries like finance, trade and industry, foreign affairs, defense and justice. The DA was given six ministerial positions with its leader John Steen Hussein as a new minister of agriculture. The DA was aiming for the trade and industry portfolio, a position that the ANC kept among its members. Okay. Now we've seen what, um, what's happened in South Africa. Now, what do you think this power sharing deal will pretend for the country? Well, I think South Africa has gone back to 1994. Mm. We tend to forget very easily that in 1994, when Mandela came um, on board as president, he, ANC did not rule alone until the deal broke down with um, the then president. But for today, it, one could have seen it coming, given that the ANC has been in power for the past um, 30 years running. And being that the ANC came from the trenches fighting for independence, winning the war, and then political power, it goes with a lot of responsibility that Party in power makes promises. And for the ANC, having fought, it came with great expectations. The speed of governance has been slower than the people's expectations on one hand. And on the other, the capacity to even meet the basic needs of the people. I mean, take for instance, the issue of power, electricity in South Africa. Mm. 1994, when South Africa, um, there was that transition from Apathetic. white minor minority rule to black majority rule, power was very sufficient in South Africa. But as of today, the Russian power, mm. generators that were alien, have become a common sight in the average home and company in South Africa. So too is manufacturing. The numbers keep going down with the ANC in power. Correspondingly, there is a rise in corruption. And so, people, especially the ordinary folks in South Africa, have gotten tired with false promises, have gotten tired with um, hypocrisy. You see the leaders getting into office, becoming richer than they were, and the people, on the other hand, are sinking lower and lower in poverty and penury. So an alliance between the ANC and other parties would come with its challenges because whereas the ANC could use its dominant majority and ram its way, now the government is forced to negotiate. And every negotiation will involve give and take. And in giving and take, it means there are certain things that you hold dear. You cannot be maximalist in your approach. On the other hand, too, like the DA that today is in government. If you ask an average black South African, they call the whites in South Africa boars, that they are boars. And so to ask a black South African to deal with a boar is like asking the impossible. But that is the reality. Ramaphosa in office for a second term, and now having to lead this coalition is the one who will have to fashion a way of balancing his act in order not to further alienate his party with the electorate, and at the same time maintain that hope that the ANC will continue to be relevant in South Africa. Otherwise, I see it, and I had more or less projected that after 25 years of black rule in South Africa, we will one day wake up to some surprises. And this, in my mind, is the first of many surprises that will come in South Africa. Okay, you're already going into my second question, so I'm just gonna ask you so you can just delve more into it, which is the, do you think, you know, like now the ANC mm -hmm. and the DA are, as you said, white, 
and blacks. And strange bedfellows. Yes, strange bedfellows. That's, that's actually the word I put in my question. Mm -hmm. How do you think, how do you see this playing out in engendering successful, smooth administration of that country? Wow, it's a big question. It all depends on the attitude of the two parties and their constituencies, okay? First and foremost, in terms of ideology, they differ, okay? And number two, the base of the two parties is not necessarily the same. I, I mentioned before that the DA is predominantly a party for white South Africans, whereas the ANC is, as the name goes, a black party. Now, ideologically, the two are not the same. So if now, as partners in government, one thing is sure, that anything that is agreed by the South African cabinet will be binding on the partners. So that's one end of the equation. But each will rule and deliver with their eyes on a site of tomorrow, where if they have to go and face the electorates in another election, they will give an account. And I know for the DA, coming into government after 30 years, they would welcome, and certainly they do welcome the opportunity. That's why they entered into the alliance in the first place. How and what they come up with will depend largely on the individuals that are assigned to the portfolios that have been given to the different parties. And so if each party goes with legacy at the back of its mind, realizing that in opposition or government today, you can, if you are in opposition, you may be in government tomorrow, or if you are in government, you could be in opposition, opposition tomorrow. tomorrow. The ANC in particular must really guard against complacency. So whereas others can come in and say it's the first time, it is the ANC that has the larger part of the brunt to bear if it fails. All right. Now, to, to tie this up, do you see the ANC picking up or further losing the small lead they got, you know, this, 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 this election cycle? I'm not a South African. Okay. So anything I say, I'm saying with the freedom of being a foreigner also not understanding the real dynamics at play in South Africa. But as is often the case, look at where Jacob Zuma came from. He came from the ANC. The first major break from the party. Mm. Will that be the last? I doubt it. Mm. Mm. All right now, so we're going to go to UK and just, it's like there's, there's a theme going on currently with um, <laughs> parties in power losing out to opposition party. But over in the UK, the Labour Party has officially won enough seats in the UK's 24 general election to have a majority in Parliament as vote counting continues now after a ceremonial kissing of hands with King Charles III. Labour leader Keir Starmer has become Prime Minister and can form a majority government. Starmer has led Labour to a landslide election victory and becomes the first leader from the centre-left party to win a UK national election since Tony Blair, who won three in a row starting in 1997. The Labour Party has won this general election and I have called Sir Keir Starmer to congratulate him on his victory. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Today we start the next chapter. Begin the work of change, the mission of national renewal, and start to rebuild our country. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I know that the United Kingdom, as the name implies, does not connote anything African. No. Yes, but we know that some of these things have an effect on the runnings of the continent. I don't know why, but it actually does have effects on the running of the continent. And, you know, there is an issue of Rwanda asylum, and I think Labour is not, uh, is not a king to that whole idea. No. But, you know, you tell me, what do you see happening with this? Well, um, 
The outcome of the UK election, I think, is one that um, should have been expected. Ever since the UK voted to leave the European Union, a referendum that David Cameron had called, thinking that somehow, somehow, the majority will vote to remain, even if at the time the Conservative Party, it was a fringe wing of the party that was advocating the exit. But the result was what it was. You recall that um, Boris Johnson lost his seat on account of that referendum. Then Rishi Sunak mm, came in me. as the final um, um, holder of yes. office and leader of the Conservative Party. But what we see in the outcome of the UK election, and as you really pointed out, that Labour was coming back to power for the first time since Tony Blair did it three in a row, unprecedented. Mm -hmm. Today, across the world, but especially the United States and the United Kingdom, and Europe as a bloc, you see there are two extremes. The left is very far extreme, and the right is also far extreme. We should keep our eyes out on the what outcome of what will follow in France. Yes, because we'll, we'll, we'll these we'll extremists are the ones dictating the pace of politics around the world. Um, we're already looking at the elections, this major elections happening. Russia has had its own, mm -hmm. now the UK has had its own, mm -hmm. and France is about to have its own. And mm -hmm. in November, we're going to go to America, and these are four major Western countries, countries yeah. that are very interested on the African continent, mm -hmm. very much interested. Mm -hmm. Now, um, Putin got re-elected, Labour has kicked off the Conservatives. Mm -hmm. What are we seeing? You know, how do these things really affect us in this continent, the outcomes of these elections? I think it should be a wake-up call. If I retread what I said, it, it has to be a wake-up call. And in fact, the APC in office should remember their 16 years, I mean, as opposition. It wasn't APC at the time, mm -hmm. but a coalition of different parties that ultimately formed the APC. That one party from 1999 was in office until 2015. Now, 2015 came, it was a watershed when the government or the party in government was voted out. If we really want to pride ourselves as a democratic nation, one in which the government is by the people, for the people, and you know, really answering to the tenets of democracy. democracy, we must allow the wishes of the people to prevail. Ghana has given us an example. Since Jerry Rawlins, no party has been in office longer than eight years. Okay. They alternate between one in and the other out. Okay. But let the people have a say in okay. choosing who leads them. Okay, so we're going to be going on a break. And when we come back, we'll be looking at what's happening with a refugee teaching people in Somali. To stay with us. Welcome back. Now, after fleeing conflict in Somalia, Muhammad Martin overcame many challenges growing up in Kenya's Dadaab refugee camp. Today, he is helping young refugees learn digital skills that could lead to a brighter future. VOA reporter Ahmed Hussein met Matan in the Dagahili section of Dabab and has the story. Here in Dagahili refugee camp in northeastern Kenya, 30-year-old Mohamed Matan is teaching young refugees digital skills and hopes that those skills can lead to better opportunities. 
We teach both basic and advanced computer program and other skills like freelancing, data entry, web development and web design to help refugee youth access online jobs. In your web development, web design. Matan's parents fled Somalia in 2001 when he was just was seven years old. Matan initially started doing manual work, but later he enrolled in a UN-supported digital skills training program in the camps. Now, Matan hopes the skills he's teaching will help young refugees stay out of trouble. I started this initiative to help youth in the refugee camps avoid drug abuse and other activities that will compromise safety and security. Once a refugee is unemployed, they tend to engage in harmful activities, so we decided to empower them. Students are able to attend different classes during the week, while some opt for weekend sessions. Abdurrahman Hassan is one of the trainees and says the program has benefited him. We have learned digital skills like freelancing online, software and other computer skills that will enable me to access opportunities online and earn a living. We have benefited a lot. And software, Halaban, accounting, Halaban, and Mashanka Bartai. Matan currently offers free classes to over 70 students in the refugee camp and aims to expand the program. However, he says there are some difficulties and needs assistance. Some of the challenges we face are using old computers and the internet is slow. But if we get support, we hope to expand and improve the machines to keep up with the changing digital technology. Kenya is home to nearly 800,000 refugees and asylum seekers primarily from Somalia and South Sudan, according to the United Nations. Trained refugees such as Mohamed Matan are optimistic that the skills they have gained here will pave the way for greater opportunities ahead. It doesn't matter what you've been through, you can actually help a life and make a life better, no matter whatever life has done to you. That's as our package today on Africa Update. For more of our programs, documentaries and news, be sure to follow us on our social media platforms and on our YouTube live stream. It's been a wonderful experience this week. See you next week.